Good Mental Health. I'm your host, Matt Kelly. I'm pleased to once again be joined by my co-host and behavior expert, Dr. Neil Marinello. Neil, as always, it's a, a pleasure to have you on the show and to share this time with your brilliant expertise. <laughs> well, my pleasure. Um, you are a solutions-focused life coach in Woodstock, Vermont, and I do refer to you as a behavior expert. I think it's important that before we begin, we just touch a little bit about that. Your experience in human behavior spans over half a century um, and began when you were one of the youngest to enter Harvard Medical School. Is that correct? Not Harvard Medical School, Harvard College. Harvard College. Yeah, I was uh, 16 when I went to Harvard. And uh, there was a 13 year old in my class and I had to deal with the part of me that uh, uh, wanted to either hug him or kill him. <laughs> wow. And from that, you've really had experience, whether it be one on one individual coaching sessions, but also uh, clinical experience, both in hospital, uh, working in prisons, uh, quite a wide uh, experience dealing with human behavior. Well, I think that uh, from the time I was uh, uh, quite young, let's say 15 years old, I became fascinated with the idea of uh, exposing myself to as many different kinds of uh, weird people who engaged, who engaged in weird behaviors as I could. And it started off uh, at Harvard working for Phillips Brooks House, uh, going to Metropolitan State Hospital, which was the state hospital for Massachusetts at the time and uh, working in the back wards with people who had been diagnosed schizophrenic. Uh, since then, uh, I worked with every kind of uh, mental disorder and, uh, and I would say uh, personality disorder that I could find. And my goal has been to understand how people think. Wonderful. Well, our topic for today is is just right up your alley. And, you know, I'm fortunate because I get to pick the topics, but we're drawing directly from uh, your tweets on Twitter. And uh, our audience is invited to follow uh, Neil directly on Twitter. His handle is at do, uh, Coach Dr. Neil, at Coach Dr. Neil on Twitter. And our subject for today is there is no part of me that is not a part of you, or vice versa, as we should say, there is no part of you that is not a part of me. And Neil, why don't you uh, uh, briefly just take us into the concept and uh, uh, we'll dig deep as uh, we continue in this discussion. Sure. Uh, I think I, I began working with this idea uh, many, many years ago when I started to read uh, the science fiction of Theodore Sturgeon. Uh, who was a science fiction writer in the uh, 50s and afterwards. And uh, I think to me, his most uh, famous book was called More Than Human. But his concept was that there would be no wars if everybody was inside everybody else's head. Mm. That everybody's got secrets that they don't want anyone else to know. And, uh, uh, and if those secrets were all exposed, we would all realize we're just, you know, people doing the best we can. Uh, the the uh, way I translated that into a sermon at our church in the late 90s was to entitle the sermon, No Better Than Hitler, No Worse Than Jesus. Mm. And I was using uh, uh, Hitler and Jesus as personifications of uh, uh, what the social constructs uh, call them evil and good. Uh, the idea of it was, though, that there's no part of Hitler that isn't a part of me, and there's no part of Jesus that isn't a part of me. And what I was saying was, we all have chemicals that operate within us, uh, emotions that operate within us, thoughts that operate within us, uh, but there are no bad chemicals, uh, emotions, or thoughts. There are only bad deeds, and the things that we do are the things that we need to take responsibility for. So that's a start. Uh, there's many other people that have, uh, uh, have written about this concept. Uh, Debbie Ford was one of the best. Uh, uh, she wrote a book called uh, The Dark Side of the Light Chasers. Uh. And uh, uh, in that book, she talks about how uh, uh, she was really furious with a particular woman uh, who she saw as a true bitch 
And then she realized that that woman represented the worst part of herself. Oh. And uh, as a result of that, I actually bought a t-shirt, which I use occasionally with my clients, <laughs> especially the female ones. And here's the t-shirt. Queen uh, of denial, love it. <laughs> That's great. But denial is the key to understanding bad behavior. Mm. Uh, the, when people do bad things, it's usually because they're trying to uh, deny the fact that there's a part of them uh, that could be like the person that they're criticizing. And it's happened to me many times. Uh, uh, the most recent time I was watching a, uh, uh, a, uh, a situation in which I, I was watching a DVD uh, that was about Leonard Cohen. And Leonard Cohen is, uh, of course, a magnificent songwriter and one of the best uh, poets and Buddhists uh, that, uh, that many of us would like to emulate. Uh, but in watching this DVD that was a tribute to Leonard Cohen, there was someone named Anthony Hegarty uh, who was singing a song that, uh, that Leonard Cohen had written called If It Be Your Will. Mm. And, the, and Anthony Hegarty was dressed as a uh, transvestite and was, uh, as he was singing the song, acting uh, very feminine. And it infuriated me. And uh, in my business, if you get any intense emotion about anything, uh, I've got to figure out what's going on with me. Otherwise, I'm not going to be that helpful for other people. Uh, so I watched it 10 more times. And uh, uh, about the eighth or ninth time, uh, uh, when I realized I wanted to start throwing things at the, uh, uh, at the TV, uh, I began realizing that, uh, that uh, whether he was posing uh, as it or whether he was just a very good actor, uh, Anthony was in fact uh, uh, demonstrating to me that he had been exposed to almost the same kind of abuse that I had been exposed to growing up but he had made the exact opposite decisions. In other words, uh, uh, when I was growing up in the 50s uh, and uh, I saw and I felt very emasculated by uh, uh, a very powerful Columbia Law School graduate mother, uh, I uh, would watch a Paul Newman movie or a Steve McQueen movie and model my behavior after them. Uh, and I realized that uh, in his extremely feminine behavior, Anthony, Hegre uh, Anthony uh, Hegarty had uh, uh, gone the exact opposite way. That every time he had chosen to be more feminine, uh, I had chosen to be more masculine. In other words, using it in Jungian terms, he was my shadow. Uh -huh. And uh, that's why I was furious with him. I refused to recognize that I could just as easily have been him. I have to say, and this is what I just love about our conversations, uh, it is completely different than what I had interpreted or expected, uh, in essence, our, our show to be about to, today. And I kind of want to just share what I was thinking that this would sort of be. And, and that is that, again, the concept being that there is no part of you that is not a part of me, it has to do with what is transmitted to my cornea that then translates to my amygdala that is gets interpreted. And so, for example, if I happen to witness uh, uh, a behavior or, uh, or I have a reaction to someone, some person, I have to take responsibility for it because it is my mind that has interpreted this that my eyes, my corneas have actually seen. And so while Neil Marinello is his own individual person, my interaction with you colors my viewpoint of you and has very little to do with who Dr. Neil Marinello actually is. Mm -hmm. And yet I have to take responsibility for that anger or that fear or whatever emotion comes up mm -hmm. because it, it is my mind that has triggered it. Um, and it is my vision that has seen it. And to, to give this another way, if you look just into the background around me, you'll see different shapes and different colors 
um, and, and whatnot. And for me, I love that because that shapes and colors and, and designs, but somebody else may just view that as uh, a cacophony, if you will, of, of different uh, colors and things. And it may be very confusing for them and, and whatnot. But again, I look at it and I see abundance of shape, color, sizes, and interact with that. But somebody else may have a different reaction. And yet I have to take responsibility for my own reaction to what my eyes see and what my brain translates. Therefore, what my eyes see, I have to take responsibility for. And that's why there is no part of you that is not part of me. And that's how I interpreted uh, this this question and and yet I just love it because it's it's different uh, from how you approach this. Um, well, it so isn't, it isn't. Uh, there, the, the truth is that your example is extremely good because uh, the uh, the optical nerves actually reverse images uh, in the brain, and your brain turns it over so it looks up, so it looks right side up, uh, but. The, uh, the term I used last week when we talked was significate. The meaning that you give to what you see mm. is yours and yours alone. And there's a lot of evidence that uh, eyewitness testimony is not very good because if you have several people that see exactly the same accident from different angles, they'll all tell uh, almost as many different stories about the accident as, uh, uh, as there are people uh, because each person interprets it through his own perception. Uh, the the uh, issue here has to do much more with the difference between the meaning that you give to something mm. you see and whether the effect of that meaning on you results in behavior which is good, bad, or crazy. Mm. Uh, the, the, uh, the difference being uh, uh, good behavior is behavior which in one way or another helps yourself or other people without unnecessarily hurting others. Uh, bad behavior is behavior in which you are uh, purposely hurting yourself or others uh, to make yourself feel better and knowing it. Uh, crazy behavior is behavior in which you are uh, uh, acting, believing something to be true that is not true. Mm. Not necessarily even understanding that you're hurting yourself or others by doing that. One other way that, you know, I came to this, this question was to recognize that, you know, despite all our differences of hair color, gender, size, shape, sexuality, whatever it is, ultimately we're much more alike than we are different. So again, uh, approaching the, the the topic, there is no part of you that is not a part of me. Uh, coming down to a very basic cellular level, uh, is it is it is its own truth, if you will. Well, that is true. Yes, uh, but the, in the uh, uh, in the business that I'm in, the issue is much more: what are the parts of myself that I don't want to acknowledge? Mm. I don't want to recognize are actually things that exist in me. Uh, so many people who behave in, uh, uh, in evil ways uh, actually are not aware of that. They, in their own mind, they think they're doing the best they can. Mm. Uh, but in many cases, they are in fact uh, uh, behaving in ways which are consistent with some distorted perception of reality. So uh, I'll give you an example. Yeah. Um, I had uh, uh, many years ago, I had uh, read a report that was written by an expert forensic psychiatrist uh, about a particular uh, patient that he had. Uh, he was asked to evaluate that person. This person had, uh, was in jail, had committed many uh, uh, rapes uh, and uh, uh, had a pattern of committing rapes that uh, uh, had resulted in his being put in jail probably for the rest of his life. Uh, I met with that person and uh, uh, after reading the report, and uh, in the report, it basically was talking about how this guy had grown up on a farm and had had sex with cows, uh, a fairly disgusting image. Uh, 
the report that was written by the psychiatrist talked about that uh, and then immediately went into a diagnosis. The diagnosis was antisocial personality disorder, uh, which was a totally appropriate diagnosis. But what I was asking myself was, what's going on inside this guy's head while he's having sex with cows? Mm. And is there a way that that, that that distorted thought process that he has can be used to stop him from raping people in the future? And it took quite a while for me talking to him to get his trust and to get him talking to me. Uh, there's a Netflix series, I think, called Bind Hunter, uh, which talks about how important it is to get inside the head of people who commit hor horrendous crimes. Uh, and once you can do that, the possibility of uh, seeing them as human beings rather than as monsters, which of course their behavior makes them, uh, gives you an opportunity to say, okay, could I do that? Or would I be capable of doing that? Mm. And what part of me would be capable of doing that? Mm. Uh, so it's a very, uh, it's a very interesting process understanding how people think that gives them permission to do such horrible things. Uh, in, in my own experience, it comes down to the fact that, uh, uh, that if you refuse to recognize that there's a part of you that's capable of doing something bad, that there's a monster inside your own head that you have to get to know, make friends with, perhaps even accept, uh, the odds that you're going to actually act in horrible ways become much less. Good mental health. We're speaking with Dr. Neil Marinello. Our topic here today is there is no part of you that is not a part of me. And, you know, this sort of brings up to me uh, the issue of shame. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I feel in a sense that that's sort of what we're, we're kind of talking about here, that um, if it's something about myself that I don't like, that, there, that shame is attached to that. And then as a result, um, there may be efforts to push that down, uh, which comes out in, in less productive ways. Well um, said. Well said. Uh, pushing it down, in fact, is a very good analog because uh, uh, trying to deny shame is a little like packing a cannon. Mm. Uh, you refuse to acknowledge that. Uh, at some point, there's a chance that it's going to go boom. Uh, the reality is that, uh, that, in my mind anyway, uh, shame is one of the most ignored issues in the field of mental health. Mm. Uh, the other issue... And would I you also say that it's probably one of the primary drivers of mental health? Absolutely. I would even say that, uh, that shame is an issue which exists uh, uh, in the first year of life. Mm. Uh, and uh, a child experiences that. Uh, I remember uh, reading uh, a woman named Karen Horney, who was a, uh, uh, a person who had a, uh, a theory of uh, personality, and in, in which she said, uh, every child has two mothers, uh, the mother that uh, changes their diaper when they're hungry, and the mother that uh, gives them milk when they're hungry. And uh, the child, of course, doesn't know how to do anything but cry. So if the uh, if the child uh, gets the diaper change when, when the child's hungry, uh, that's the bad mother. And the child wants to get rid of that mother and just have the one that uh, changes the diaper when, uh, when the child is wet. Uh, the, uh, the child, however, is totally dependent on the mother and is looking at the mother and sees the face of the mother. And, uh, and if the child uh, gets the diaper changed when the child is actually uh, hungry. Uh, the child sees the expression on mother's face, and that's the bad mother. Of course, the child doesn't know how to do anything but cry. And so you wind up with this situation where uh, the child associates the face of the, uh, uh, of the mother uh, with shame. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and of course, there is no real shame in it, uh, but there is from the child's point of view, the child mm -hmm. isn't getting what, uh, what he or she wants. Wow, wow. Uh, one other area that I wanted to kind of extrapolate here on this, you know, having worked with you uh, for a number of years for full disclosure, I've been a client of Dr. Neil Maronello's going back, you know, uh, to the mid nineties um, and seeing you off and on uh, since then. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that 
you have shared with me, which I see pertinent to today's topic is putting yourself in someone else's shoes to, for example, if there's about racism, let's just use that as a, as a topic, which is very uh, prevalent here today, the topic of racism. Mm -hmm. And the way to perhaps understand it is to actually put yourself in the shoes of someone and to actually take their position. And it may be a position that is opposite of your own. Um, and it's only when you're able to do that, that perhaps empathy might be able to be achieved because you come to it from a different point of view, again, being that there is no part of you that is not a part of me. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think that uh, the, the issue of racism uh, uh, has come up, you know, uh, quite intensely lately. And the bottom line on it is that uh, uh, it's pretty hard to get inside the head of somebody who puts his foot on someone else's throat and doesn't lift it. At the same time, uh, it's much easier to get inside the head of the person who's being killed by that. Uh, <laughs> But the, uh, the objectivity, the process of saying to yourself, uh, what I'm doing is acceptable, is right, is something that, uh, that the people who are talking and saying things around me uh, uh, don't know that I'm doing the right thing. Uh, the, whatever uh, the, the reality is of the inner thought process, uh, it has nothing to do with the reality of what's happening now. Mm. Uh, and uh, I, I can remember a case that I had very early that taught me an awful lot of a situation where I received a call from a lawyer who said, uh, 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 Dr. Marinello, you've had uh, uh, more experience testifying than anybody else, but I'm not calling you about that. Uh, I'm calling you because I have a client uh, who murdered a, a teenage girl, mm -hmm. and he doesn't know why he did it. Hmm. And he wants you to tell him why. Uh, and, and I said to the lawyer, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I don't believe that for a minute. Uh, and the lawyer said, no, he's willing to sign anything at all. So you don't have to testify. You don't have to say anything. He just wants to know why he did it. He can't sleep at night. And uh, he knows he's going to jail and he deserves it. Uh, but he doesn't understand why. Uh, so I had everybody sign a bunch of paper that uh, covered my ass, so I wouldn't have to testify. And I, it was a fascinating job getting inside this guy's head. I gave him a bunch of tests. I talked to him quite a bit, and uh, uh, it turned out that he was a he was a big guy, but he had in fact uh, uh, been born a twin. Uh, by the way, I'm changing some of the facts here so that uh, uh, to protect the guilty. identities are kept confidential. <laughs> exactly. Well, to protect the guilty. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, uh, uh, he was a twin and his uh, twin was a, uh, a female and uh, she did very well in school and he did very poorly. And uh, when he was eight years old, his mother had uh, uh, started having an affair. Uh, and, uh, and wound up divorcing his father. And uh, his father had to work uh, three different jobs in order to pay the child support. Um, and uh, uh, prior to his murdering this teenage girl, he had uh, wound up um, uh, getting uh, jilted by his girlfriend. And he started on a bender and was drinking and driving around in his uh, pickup truck and uh, picked up a couple of teenage girls and uh, who were totally drunk. And he uh, dropped one of them off at her home and the other one he took to a lover's lane and uh, uh, tried to have sex with her. And she was too drunk and, uh, and he was unsuccessful in having sex with her. Kept going back and drinking more beer and then choked her to death and didn't understand why. Mm. And after talking to him for quite a while, I was able to uh, make a guess and the guest turned out to be on the mark. And the guess was that he killed her to prevent a single thought from entering his head. And that thought was that he wished he was female. Wow. And when I said that to him, uh, I had never understood the term blanched before. He literally turned white. Mm. And he said, my God, that's why I've been having those dreams. Now, this was the 70s, a long time ago. Uh, but the dreams he was having was that he had gone to 
Sweden and had a sex change operation. We hadn't wow. told anybody that at all. And and would you say that shame was was present with him in this as well? I'd say it was the major factor. Yeah. If he hadn't been ashamed of that thought, he might not have killed her. Mm. Mm. You know, as I, I think about you and, and your history and, and whatnot, you've had uh, a great opportunity to get in the head of some pretty, by public standards, despicable individuals. Absolutely. Um, and, and have come to this uh, realization, again, there is no part of you that is not a part of me. And so in that, I would assume that you've recognized shame within yourself. Um, and perhaps maybe that was the, the Anthony Haggerty story uh, yeah. and its genesis as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. And wondering if we could just expound on that a little bit more. Well, uh, let's keep it personal. You know, mm. it was very hard for me to get inside your head when you mm. took a loaded gun, put it to your heart, and pulled the trigger. Sure. At the same time, uh, the state of mind that you were in at that point makes perfect sense to me because of the extreme amount of, uh, of shame that you were experiencing, the extreme amount of, uh, uh, of pain that you were experiencing, and the desire to stop it. Mm. And, uh, uh, and that's uh, on a scale of one to 10 of suicide attempts, that's a 10. Uh, For sure. The fact that you're alive is to me uh, a representation of an opportunity. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and it comes right up against the meaning of life. Uh, shame and the, uh, the fact that we're all going to die mm. are, I think, two of the most important forces that are operating for everybody. And the reality is that most people uh, would rather not think about either of those things. Mm. And so the process of denying that results in you're wearing the t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is that, uh, uh, that you survived. Mm. And the question is, why did you survive? Mm. And if you wanna say it's all a bunch of random existential bull, you can say, okay, but that doesn't lead you anywhere. If you want to say, wait a minute, there's got to be a reason why I survived and let me significate it. Let me give a meaning to it. Mm. Let me do something with the rest of my life, uh, like what you've been doing, which is expressing your artistic capacities in various ways and turning yourself into a person who, uh, whose talent clearly shows. And, and yet we can say even that the, the impetus for that is shame over that event uh, and to try to make amends for it and to try to capitalize on it in a way that uh, empowers me uh, and allows me to still be fully creative. Um, Does that feel right? Yeah. What you said just feels right to me, yeah. you know? And so uh, I call it the nickel dropping, mm. yeah, you know? And, and that dates me because in the, old, uh, in the old days, we used to have these Coke machines and uh, you'd put a nickel in it and uh, the Coke would come out if you, if it, if you put it in right. Mm -hmm. If it didn't, you wouldn't hear the nickel drop. And so you'd have to push the coin return uh -huh. and, and then spin it a little bit and hope that yeah. you could end up getting your Coke that way. Uh, but what you just said, dropped a nickel for me. And yeah, it for and it's unfortunate that it had to take such an extreme uh, action on my mm -hmm. part, but again, that's uh, wrong thinking, and that will be a topic of another of our future conversations. Uh, could be considered uh, unfortunate or, or it could be considered fortunate. Mm. The question it's is all about signification alive. again. Yeah, exactly. The question is, why are you alive? And why are some people who who attempted suicide uh, at, a, at a two or a three on a scale of 10, uh, why did they die? Mm. Uh, uh, and the answer could be, it's all a bunch of random crap. Mm. Or it could be, if you give it meaning, mm. you wind up get, getting a raison d'etre, uh, a reason for living that works for you. It may or may not work for me or for someone else, but it doesn't have to. And so as we, 
you know, move forward here and, and, and we wrap up with, with our topic, there's no part of you that is not a part of me. Sure. Let's try to encapsulate that here uh, in this regard with myself. How, how do, do we as a public try to keep that thought in, in our forefront rather than in a back uh, recess, because I, I would suspect, and, and as you started out with this uh, in the show, is that if we were able all to probably keep that in our forefront, mm -hmm. you know, there'd probably be less war, less violence, less crime uh, in our communities and, and directed towards ourselves. Yes, I think that it starts with, if you feel strongly about anything, uh, it's worth examining. Mm -hmm. Anything that you have a strong feeling about. The, uh, in the AA community, they say, uh, if you spot it, you got it. Mm. Uh, but we're talking about the fact that, uh, that uh, very strong emotions are suggestive that you're, you're packing a cannon and trying to not think about something that it would help if you thought about. And, and let's be clear here. I mean, the, the emotion can be glad, sad, mad, happy, sure. sexually stimulated, whatever it is, if it impacts you strongly, um, it would be wise to unpack it and try to get to a root. It certainly can be. Uh, in terms of emotions, I'm a reductionist. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, I used to say there's only four emotions, mad, sad, glad, and scared. Oh. Uh, uh, at one point in my reductionistic uh, experience, I reduced it to two emotions, uh, mad, scared, and sad, glad, uh, mm -hmm. because they are on a continuum. Uh, the uh, uh, stream of scared is panic. The extreme of uh, anger is rage. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but they're not miles apart. They're, there's a bridge between those two. And because you can laugh until you cry, there's a bridge between sad and glad also. Mm. Uh, any extreme feeling that you have, I believe is worth understanding, looking at and saying, uh, is it possible that I'm denying the part of me that feels the opposite? And if so, can I allow that part to exist? The concept here, uh, currently is referred to, I think, as radical acceptance, mm. uh, which is the, uh, the shrink version of love. Mm. Loving someone is uh, wanting what's best for them, even if it's not what's best for you. Uh, uh, radical acceptance is accepting that there may be parts of you that you can't stand, that are actually monsters, mm. uh, but that you have to accept and even love those parts of yourself in order to not let them control your behavior so that you wind up doing bad things. And again, if you're recognizing it or seeing it in somebody else, more than likely it's triggering you because you recognize it or, or, or you're uh, 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 failing to recognize it mm -hmm. within yourself. And exactly. it's only when you are able to recognize it within yourself and come to a point of, like you just said, radical acceptance, mm -hmm. that you will then be able to accept that in somebody else? Yes, uh, to take it to, uh, to the logical extreme. Uh, uh, Hitler was not Jewish, but there was a part of him that thought like a Jew. Mm. And perhaps if he had accepted that part of him, he wouldn't have killed 6 million Jews. Wow, that's pretty intense. Mm -hmm. Well. It, uh, it, it, here, here's an interesting example. This is a Mont Blanc pen. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a pen freak. And, uh, <laughs> and this particular pen, uh, 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 what Hitler did was hire someone to make him the best pen in the world. And uh, he hired a Jewish man to do it. And of course, that Jewish man was aware of the fact that Hitler was not a nice guy. Uh, he made this pen and the symbol of the pen is right on the top here. It's uh, what's supposedly the, uh, the snowy cap of Mont Blanc. Uh, in fact, if you look at it closely, it's a Jewish star filled in. Yes, it is. Yeah. Wow. 
a Jew managed to thumb his nose at Hitler with the, <laughs> with, by following his orders. Same time. We've been speaking with Dr. Neil Marinello, behavior expert and solutions-focused uh, life, coach, life coach out of uh, Woodstock, Vermont. Our topic today has been, there is no part of you that is not a part of me. I want to thank Dr. Neil for his time here today. A reminder that you can follow Dr. Neil directly on Twitter. His handle is at Coach Dr. Neil, and uh, I can personally attest that he's got true nuggets of gold in there. And if you have the opportunity to go through and review uh, what he's written, it will definitely be a thought starter. Our topic for next week uh, is another one that I'm quite excited about. And it uh, follows on exactly what we've been speaking about today. Our topic next week will be, each of us is in our own reality. And we'll uh, follow up with that next week. So on behalf of Dr. Neil Marinello, I'm Matt Kelly. We're both wishing you good mental health.